Oh, yeah, I forgot. I usually give that to her. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's funny that uh, Reverend Clayton spoke about the end times and the last days, and because that's part of the sermon today. <laughs> so, and and you'll see that here when I read the scripture. So, uh, the scripture today is First uh, John two eighteen to twenty seven. So, children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they were, or if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you, or I write, sorry, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Heavenly Father, may we just dwell richly in that anointing that you've given us, your Holy Spirit, who guides us into all wisdom and all truth. And may the wisdom and the truth that the Spirit speaks to our hearts today enlighten our eyes to see how good you are to desire nothing more than to abide in you, to live in your presence, and to just be totally dependent on you. Lord, may we see all these truths today and, and that we wouldn't live in a spirit of fear, knowing that things are getting dark, but that we know we have hope because we live in your light, that we walk in your truth, and we live in the love that you've given us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, um, so when I sat down to write my sermon this week, I realized that there, there's two big subjects in here that tend to make me nervous. And you kind of guess what those would be just by the text. The first one is the last days or the last hour or the end times. And the reason I get, well, the word just jumps out at me and I get a little bit of anxiety because I've seen so many people that start, they, they like to argue about things like this. You know, when, when's the last time coming? Are we living in the last days? You know, what, what country is this from the Bible? Things like that. And they, it gets distracting. And the other one is this Antichrist, because it's not just that one person, right? In, Le in Revelation, it talks about the Antichrist, this deceiver who's going to lead, the, lead people astray, doing signs and wonders. And, and it says that if it, were, you know, if it were possible, he might even deceive the faithful. But we know it's not possible because we have that anointing. We have the Holy Spirit. But when I hear those words, it, I think to myself, well, it's hard for me to focus on the hope that I have in Jesus and how to recognize that hope that I have in Jesus when all the images I have of the last days and the Antichrist are really quite frightening. Um, so I kind of feel the need to talk a little bit about what 
what John is speaking about directly here, even if it's just for no other reason than to free myself from my own distractions, uh, to, to focus on the real message of the text. Okay, so what I need to say first is when, when Scripture talks about the last hour, uh, the last days, these end times, things of that nature, it started almost 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to heaven and the Holy Spirit was poured out. Okay. Now we continue in those last days. I saw a really interesting illustration. It says that the history went along like this. And when Jesus went up to heaven, here's the end times. And we're living right here on the edge of the end times ever since he ascended. Um, so we live in the last hour no less than John and his church lived in the last hour. Now I tend to think that maybe we're a little closer to the end of that last hour. But fortunately for me and for us, God doesn't operate on our time frame and he doesn't see the time same way we do. He has got a he has his plan and he's going to see his plan to completion regardless of how I think it should work out. Okay. But we live in these last days and I and I get the idea that it it began at with the ascension and pentecost because in in Joel one of the prophecies that is always talking about the end times says that it'll come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servant in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Okay. So the, the beginning of the last times is marked by the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on all people, which started at Pentecost. Now, I will admit that the time is starting to seem rather long because the disciples believed that Jesus was going to come back, oftentimes within their own lifetime. But then they got to a point where they realized, hey, um, maybe we're wrong. We better start writing this stuff down so that we end up with these gospel accounts. But there was this wasn't a... So I'm sure John knew in his day that people were starting to say, well, hey, wait a minute, you said Jesus was coming back right away. And Peter actually addressed this question in, this is in 2 Peter 3, and it's verse 4 and then 8 and 9. They'll say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now, they knew that they were living in the end days. Almost 2,000 years ago, they knew that it was, it was the end times. And... They, they had this hope. But the hope wasn't that imminently Jesus was going to come back and set everything right. You know, they, they believed that. They believed that that would happen. But their hope was that God doesn't operate based on our expectations or our timelines. The Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise. He's not being slow. He's showing his love and his mercy. Okay. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. He's patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish and wants all to come to repentance. Okay. We're still in the last hour because God is still working to redeem people to himself. Okay, That was his mission from the beginning. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned, God's mission was to redeem people to himself through Jesus. And that still hasn't stopped. That's why we're still in the last days. It's because he wants everyone to come to know him and to be reconciled to him. And he puts that promise in the middle of the, this, this section in John that the promise we receive is eternal life. 
Okay? And I think that's why John reminds us of that promise and that hope of eternal life. Because no matter how long the last hour is, no matter how long we're waiting for Jesus to come again and bring about the fullness of our redemption, when we get to dwell in the presence of God, we still have that hope that it will happen. Now, it, this brings me to my, my second big distraction. Uh, and for me, it's I call it a problem topic because <laughs> it creates a lot of problems when you get people that talk about it that don't have the same opinion about it. And that's this antichrists. Now, I don't know about you, but when most people that I've talked to hear that word antichrist, it's like it jumps off the page as something that is it's telling you that it's close, like the end is almost here, right? And and that's what John saw, is when Jesus came, when he died on the cross, when he ascended, when he poured out his Holy Spirit, when people started following Jesus after Jesus was gone, the enemy sees that and is in strong opposition to it. He doesn't want to see God's plan to redeem people come to fulfillment. He wants to stand in opposition of people like you and me who want to be in a relationship with Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, if you've committed to following Jesus, you have an enemy who is going to try and prevent you from following him. And that's who these antichrists are, is whether they know it or not, because some people think that they're atheists and don't even believe God exists. But they're denying that Jesus is Lord. Okay. So, these people stand in, in opposition to God's will, to God's plan for our lives. And some of them, actually... I don't, I, I, I find it, there's most people that claim to be atheists. I want to word this just the right way. Most of the people that claim to be atheists are not really atheists. They're angry at God about something. Then they just don't want to admit it. So it's easier for them to say, there is no God. I'm the one that determines my future. And all you people that believe in him are, are, are foolish children that are trusting in myths. Yeah. And... I think it's easier to find those people than it is to find a true atheist. And I think there's a lot less of them than we think. But I want to talk about some of the characteristics of these antichrists, the, some of the things that they share, because John talks about them here. And I think it acts as a way for us to evaluate our own relationship with God as well. Because the opposite of what God expects from us is what defines these antichrists that John was talking about. Now, the the people that have departed is what John talks about here. So he says they were never really part of us, not in the true sense. And when I say that in the true sense, it's that they have, they have failed to abide in Jesus and then this is my favorite word again and when my wife would ask me and I've had other people ask me about my my wife the illustration that I'm gonna use is the one that I use with my wife when you're talking about abiding the the best image I could think of was this little baby otter he cannot li okay he doesn't have the oil in his fur yet and the insulation in his fur yet the only way that he can survive in these the harsh cold climates is by resting in the mother's arms and just she brings him food she shelters him she keeps him warm she cleans him she keeps him dry everything that he needs or she needs everything that baby needs is provided by that mother otter and my image is is as a christian this is you resting in your Heavenly Father's arms. Amen. Amen. You trusting and, and, and just totally dependent. Like that baby can't go and say, 
hey mom, I'm gonna go do this myself today. He's gonna jump in the water and go get some shrimp. He'll freeze to death and die or get eaten by something bigger. That's us. We cannot do things apart from Jesus. So this is the dependence we have, okay? So the fact that these antichrists, I gotta get back to this, were never part of the community is evidenced by their behavior. Okay? It's evidenced by the fact that they've gone out from the church. It's evidenced by the fact that they failed to submit to Jesus as Lord. It's evidenced by the fact that they failed to love the people around them. Even though they were attending the church, at least for a time. Okay. And I think here of all here all of John's little litmus tests for what it looks like to really follow Jesus get put very clearly in a contrast with what these antichrists have done. So the first question I, that I would ask is, am I submitting myself to Jesus as Lord? Because the Antichrist don't confess Jesus as Lord. They say the opposite. They deny him. Now, in that day, it may have looked different. Today it might look something like, well, Jesus was a great teacher. He said really good things. He said, love each other. Just go out and love each other. Those, that's great. But he's also the Lord. He's God. And... And as much as I value my personal freedom and my ability to make my own choices, I also realize that I absolutely have to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. I can't do this on my own. I can't do this in my own strength or in my own power. And I can't, you know, from a young age, people said I was a great public speaker. I don't know if that still holds true today. I've gotten a little bit wiser and more nervous and more self-conscious. But I could craft really good speeches. In, from certainly fourth grade, I could give, I would win awards for public speaking. I know it's not believable anymore, is it? But I, I would, I did. And through high school, I would do speech and debate and I was really good. So I could stand up here and I could craft a really good speech, something that the you know the Toastmasters would love, you know maybe a few pointers that they that I need to polish off, but that is not going to convince anyone that Jesus is Lord. In fact, I could do that without Jesus being the Lord of my life. I could do that in my own power. I could sit down and read all the right books, copy all the right sermons wave my arms around in just the right way, but none of it assures that I am submitting to Jesus as Lord, unless I'm abiding in him. The next one is, does, does your faith, does your walk as a Christian evidence the love of God? In other words, are you showing people in your life that God loves them. Now I know some of some people are much better than others. I know most people smile a lot more than I do and and look a lot friendlier than I do. But is your life, the way that you live, do people see that you really believe that God loves you? Do you really live like God loves you? And the way that that is shown clearly to others is how well you love others because antichrists do not love well they're narcissistic they're self-serving they gossip a lot they try to bring other people down to make themselves look better none of those things belong in the body of christ we are here okay th that love that you want to show to the world this is the best place to start showing it, is with other people who want to show God's love to the world. And what John is saying is, these people that left, 
did not love well. And I think by implication, he's asking, are you loving well? Are you loving the people around you well? Now, I can like see the love that you guys have for each other. When, when I'm here on Sunday, I, just, I feel great just sitting here watching the love that you have for each other. But what John is saying here is if you don't love others, you're living a lie. You can't say that you love God and not actually have that result ultimately in you loving others. Right? You, you may have to practice it. It's, you know, Paul said, don't owe any debt to anyone except for love. And, and it's something that may not come natural. Maybe you didn't experience love from the family that you grew up with. Maybe you experienced an abundance of it and it's easy for you. But it's something that we need to be willing to take that risk. Because love involves risk. Right? When Jesus died on the cross, there was the risk that some people would say, well, Jesus is nothing. He's just some dude that said nice things and said love each other and then they crucified him. They don't believe he's Lord. So loving well involves risk. When I asked my wife to marry me, there was the risk that she would be like, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, there's that risk of, of it having it rejected. But the love that we have as Christians has to be a, a love that risks. Um, Antichrists are also people of the lie. And it, it starts with that lie that they say they love God but don't love others. It's the lie that they deny that Jesus is the Son of God. But it's, it's, the, it's the deception and the lie that wants to make everything about them. The same way that Adam and Eve, in their first sin, they turned inwardly instead of turning to God. They wanted to make it about them. The way that Cain, wanting to, to be about him, killed his brother. The way that, that, that sin and violence and evil and theft and every other sin that you could list in the Ten Commandments still exists is because you're deceiving. They're deceiving themselves. They're saying, if I do it my way, if I look to the way that I can achieve this, I'll be happy. I'll get what I want. And you're stri they're striving to get all these things apart from abiding in Jesus. And finally, the one that really stands out for John is that the Antichrists have abandoned the church. Now, John very starkly contrasts... Whoops. That's the wrong place. I don't have it in here. Oops. Um, so John said, this is verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out. That it might become plain that they all are not of us. So the distinction to John is so clear, so wide, that he doesn't even consider that these people that left were ever really a part of the church. Okay. People who are truly abiding in God and who have his spirit abiding in them would never have gone out. To him, it's evidence that they were hanging out for, for something. You know, they wanted to be with old friends. They wanted to feel good about themselves. They thought maybe, you know, you got to go through the right motions. Jump through the right hoops. And then you'll be acceptable to God. But that's all superficial. Because to truly belong is to truly be abiding in Christ. And that happens in my day-to-day -day life, walking around. But it happens here in this church, in this body, community of believers. This fellowship is necessary. Like Christian fellowship 
And the reason I'm really big about doing like that small group discipleship is that kind of fellowship is necessary to have a faith that grows and a faith that abides. Because we were never meant to do this alone. Now this is what this is from Hebrews. Um, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as some, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the author is talking about like we're in the last times. We need each other so that we can stir each other up to love and good works. Okay? We, we're here to encourage each other. If it was just me sitting at home reading my Bible and I, I didn't come in here and you know, I didn't teach or I didn't preach or I didn't meet with people and just encourage and be encouraged, my faith gets pretty weak. No matter how strong I think it is and how much I think I know, if I don't have that encouragement of people alongside me, encouraging me to love, encouraging me to, to do good works, encouraging me to continue in the faith, I would have a pretty anemic faith. What serves, though, as our protection, as our seal, is our anointing that we have through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what keeps us in that unity in our faith. Because even in this community, even in the church, even with all these great people around us who love us, if we're not connected to Jesus, we, we end up, we start just going through the motions. So... What I, when, one thing I found really interesting, though, is, in this is when we are abiding in Jesus, we are abiding in the triune God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in fact, um, <clears throat> we abide in the Father and the Son together, but we abide in the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit, who is actually abiding in us. Okay. Now, abiding, again, is, it's, it's like an almost archaic word to mean it lives there, it rests there, it dwells there. It's, it supports you through you. Like, so the Holy Spirit, when he dwells in us, he, he helps us pray better. He gives us a unity of faith. But he gives us unity with the Father and the Son. So it's the abiding of the Holy Spirit that makes it possible for us to abide in God. Because through the Holy Spirit, we're united to the Father and the Son. So that through the abiding, and maybe you've heard this called the indwelling, like the Holy Spirit lives in you. Through the abiding of the Holy Spirit, we are abiding or resting in the Father and the Son. So the Holy Spirit is what makes it possible for us to lay there like the baby otter, just wrapped in God's loving, trusting arms. That same first calling to accept the call to follow Jesus is a call to abide in him. To accept the call to take up your cross and follow Jesus daily is a call to abide in him. To accept the call to love one another as God has loved us, is a call to abide in Him. Now, I, I put the colors up there to just, so it would stand out how much of an emphasis there is on this idea of abiding or indwelling, just resting in that. And the promise that we receive in all of this is the promise of eternal life. And this is ultimately the hope that we have. Is that we have eternal life through Jesus. And all we have to do, and I, I, 
it's so simple it sounds like it should be more complicated than it is all we have to do is is just lay there and rest in him to be totally dependent on him not ourselves not our own strength to accept that call to abide in Jesus I'm gonna ask uh, I'm gonna close with this whoa it's not uh oh Okay, I'm going to read a Bible verse. I'm sorry, it's not. I didn't add it to the PowerPoint. I put the otter back up there again. I forgot the own plan I had in my brain. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to read this verse. I just want you to meditate on it. Um, we're going to have a little piano music. And just I want you to just meditate on these words. Because this is in, in the book of John, chapter 15. And it's the, the vine and the branches analogy. And it, I think it just gives us a good focus on what it means to really be in Jesus, abiding in him. So I'm going to read. I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Father, we rest in your love. The love that was shown to us by Jesus and the love that he's called us to have for one another. Lord, may we abide in you so that we can be loved the way that you want to love us and so that we can love others the way that, that we're called to love others. So that we don't live in a fear or, or anxiety over the last days or the, the evil things that may come but we just know that abiding in your love, we have every good thing, that we have every blessing, and we have every hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, uh, because he lives.